And uh, so you can turn to the person next to you and say, you are completely clean. Completely clean. Unless you haven't given your life to Jesus, then you're completely dead in your sins. But if you've given your life to Jesus, you're completely clean, completely free. And say to the person next to you, say, you are the righteousness of God. Now, um, turn to the other person and say, I can see you don't believe it. So I'm just going to tell you again. You're the righteousness of God. Now, if you're sitting next to someone who you know, and perhaps they haven't been acting like the righteousness of God, just say, I'm just reminding you of who you really are. Because your behavior doesn't determine who you are. Your behavior doesn't determine who you are. Your behavior doesn't change the fact that you are the son or daughter of the king. Amen? Amen. So um, we're going to, it's, it's just, it's always such a delight to be able to share the word of God and uh, to have two opportunities in one weekend is absolutely fantastic. And to see so many of us gathered here today, just really, really awesome. Um, I'm, I, you can turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, but I'm going to just quote a few verses before we get there, Colossians chapter 2. And um, I want to just remind us again, well, f- something we have to re- remember is that Jesus, there was a moment in Jesus' ministry where he takes um, three of his, his closest disciples and they go up on a mountain. It, you know the story is the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus, when this whole thing takes place, he says to them, tell nobody about what has happened until after I've risen from the dead. They don't even know what Jesus is even talking about. They have no cooking clue. They do what most of us kind of do in different ways. We, we want to create a religious thing out of it. They, 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 Peter says, let's build three temples on the mountain. Let's take something that is a moment of revelation and turn it into something of a form. You with me? But Jesus is like, well, you don't really know what's going on, but you'll understand one day. But I want to just explain this. It was, it was Moses and Elijah. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. The Old Testament really, you could, if you sum the Old Testament up, you can sum it up within the law and the prophets. And throughout um, the scripture, you see them talking about the law and the prophets. And especially when Jesus comes, because he is clashing with the religious legalistic system every minute of every day. And so in his preaching, in his teaching, he's constantly, there's this, the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. There's this thing going on over and over and over again. The incredible thing, we're not going to talk, go into too much detail on that today because that would take a long time. But the incredible thing is Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets are a shadow. Jesus is the substance. And this is something that God is, that God is wanting to do in his church is bring us into a place of freedom where we leave the shadow and step into the substance. And too many Christians find themselves in a little bit of a mix between the substance and the shadow. And God is wanting to bring a clear line. We need to separate the, sub, the shadow from the substance. If I'm busy walking outside and I see the, a shadow of an airplane, have you ever seen a shadow of an airplane on the ground? Okay, you, you, you catch it from time to time, right? Because there is, there is a shadow on a good sunny day. As a plane flies past, you'll see the shadow on the ground. When you look at the shadow, you don't go, oh, wow, that's an incredible airplane. We don't do that. Usually when we see the shadow, what do we do? We look up. And we see the airplane. See these helicopters that fly around here and things, you know, you'll see the shadow. You'll look up. You, well, you usually hear it before. But, but you see the shadow and you look up at what's the real thing. When you see a signpost on the road that says three Ks to Margate, you don't go, I've arrived at Margate. No, that's just a signpost. It's pointing you to the substance, which is Margate. The law and the prophets was pointing us to something. In fact, the Bible speaks about the law as our tutor, our teacher to lead us to Jesus. If we didn't have the law and the prophets, we would have no idea of how sinful we are, how dead we are, how much of God's wrath is pointed towards unrighteousness and what he needs to do to get his sons and his daughters back. What God needs to do to get his kids back. So that's the verse I'm going to read now. Romans 1 verse 17. You stay in Colossians 2. I'm just reading Romans 1 17. For the wrath of God. Now, when, when God is wrathful, that's a lot more than just some of our anger tantrums that we have from time to time. Okay, don't look at me like you never have an anger tantrum. When God says his wrath, this is, that is a moment where you want to run for the hills. That's a moment where you say, I want the mountains to fall on me. I want to hide as far away as I can because the wrath of God is revealed. There is, in that moment, there is nothing you and I can do. Because the wrath of God, it says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So just a reminder again also is that the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 4 or chapter 5, 
think it's chapter 4. I think it's chapter 5, actually. But it's one of those two. It says, it says, in Adam all sinned. In Adam all sinned. That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that when we were born, we now sin and we become like Adam. No, Adam was our representative of the human race. When Adam sinned, we all sinned. From that moment, every single one of us are born in sin. And so the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness, all ungodliness, the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Every single one of us are in this place of ungodliness and unrighteousness. Every single one of us are dead in sins. In that same chapter in Romans, it says, but, but through Jesus, all become righteous. So, so in, in Adam, all sin, but through Jesus, all receive the gift of life. Isn't that amazing? So, so Jesus, and it says Jesus is not, it's not an equal but opposite to Adam. Jesus is greater than Adam because through one man's sin, all sinned. But Jesus, through one sacrifice, makes all righteous. The, 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 the sin that you and I will be judged for when we, when we see Jesus face to face one day at the great throne of judgment, the sin we will be judged for is the sin of unbelief. That is the sin. That will, that will determine whether we spend eternity with him or whether we spend eternity separate from him. It's the sin of unbelief because Jesus dealt with every other sin. Jesus dealt with every sin. So it's, the, it's, it's will you believe? Will you believe that what I've, done, what I've done for you, that this is true? Will you believe that I died for you? Will you believe that I rose again? And that's why that sinner hanging on the cross, there were two men hanging on the cross next to Jesus. The one was ridiculing him and blaspheming him. And the other was saying, we deserve to die for our sins. We deserve, we're up here for a reason. This man isn't here. He's, he's actually innocent. And then he turns to Jesus and says, remember me. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. One of the most incredible verses in the Bible. Today you'll be with me in paradise. That man didn't get his act sorted. He didn't get his everything cleaned up. He didn't get baptized. He didn't receive the Holy Spirit. He didn't, they, all, the, all the stuff that you and, I, you and I have the privilege of experiencing in our Christian walk, he didn't get the chance of any of that. But in a moment, he became the first person to be with Jesus in paradise. Why? Because he believed. He believed. It's about belief. It's about belief. And if we believe him, that's where the, the right living and the right behavior and the right all the other stuff comes right. We've got to be so careful even with each other. We don't try to fix each other's behavior until we fix each other's thinking about our belief in him. It's about belief in him. It's about right believing, not right doing. Because right doing follows right believing. Amen? So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So there's this extreme anger of a holy God towards sin. But then you have in, uh, well, th um, in, in Romans 1 verse 22, Paul goes on to say in the same chapter of Romans, he says, he says, professing to be wise, they became fools. There are many, many very clever fools in the world today. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 1, as I've said already, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, if you're dead, there's nothing you can do to bring yourself back to life. A dead man can't bring himself back to life. You're dead. It takes an act of God to bring us to life. It is the absolute and extreme grace of God that you and I get to sit here today, worshiping him. So we, we speak about the wrath of God. Then there's the, the love of God. 1 John 4 verse 9. In this the love of God is made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world. That we might live through him. So there's this wrath of God revealed towards unrighteousness. And God wants to deal with that situation because he's a God of justice. So he can have you and me back in his family. And so he aims all that wrath at Jesus on the cross. There's a moment where Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment where he takes on every sin that you and I have ever committed and ever will commit, every single one of us and everyone to come, all these wonderful little children in the front here, all the sins they'll com commit and all their children one day and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and the generations to come, all the generations that have passed for the last few thousand years, however far back history goes, every single sin he's taken upon himself. That's the love of God, the extreme wrath of God, the extreme love of God, that he pours his wrath out on Jesus so he can pour his love out on us. So that leads me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, and you should be there by now. And I just love these verses, just a reminder again of what it is that he did for us at the cross. And you being dead, verse 13, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive 
together with him. It's all, throughout the, the, in the New Testament, you see this constant, it was this, but now you're this. You were this, but you, now you're this. Paul would say, you were worshipers of idols, but now Jesus saved you. There's this, always this, 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 um, the, these two situations, these two positions, and it's very clear cut. You're either in the one or you're in the other. So he says, you were dead, but now he's made us alive. Having forgiven you all trespass. Everyone say all. So the sins you're going to commit next week, what has he done with them? He's forgiven you of all trespasses. What does that make you and me want to do when you hear that? Yeah, that's always the interesting question. People are like, how can you say that? Because then I'm just going to you know, go out and sin. Well, you, well, you could, but, but why would you want to? Like, I mean, like, like, oh, awesome. There's a cliff over there. Let me just run off it. Why would we want to do that? When, when he saved us, he's rescued us, he's forgiven us of all sins. Why, why would we? Why, I don't know. <laughs> when we truly understand what he's done for us, all we want to do is worship him and live for him. Amen. Amen? What we do have to be careful of is trying to make people worship him and live for him without understanding what he's done for them. We can't make people anything. We can, we can, we can point them to Jesus Christ, the substance. Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Now, we would have no understanding of what handwriting of requirements. What is it? What is he talking about? It says that which was contrary to us. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. You wouldn't know what that is. You would have no understanding of that solution if you haven't spent time reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And then you go on to see uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. And you just see like every now and then there's a good king. And then there's like five bad kings. There's like one good king. And there's like a whole bunch more bad kings. And you just think, and then God, God comes with all his prophets that are all at the end of the, the, the Old Testament. You've got all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel that goes on. And, you, and he, he, over and over and over again, you see God going like, because of your sin, because of what you're doing, I'm going to judge you. And then God tells them again. And he tells them again, anyone like, any parents ever gone like, this is going to be your consequence. And then you're like, I really hope they choose right. And then they don't. And then you like, tell them again. And you tell them again. Eventually you feel like I'm a failed parent because I've told them 20 times and they still, you know, I'm such a failed parent. But you know, then God's a failed parent too. Because he warns them over and over. Because the last thing he wants to do is judge them. It's the last thing he wants to do. But the, the wages of sin is death right? And sin is, is, is manifest through the law. So every time we, we, we're told, don't do something, if you tried, tried with your children, tried with yourself, tried with, uh, it happens with me too. Something's like, David, but they, they said, don't. Why do you want to? It happens to all of us, isn't it? It's like, don't do something. You're like, oh, I really want to do what they said I mustn't do. Let's see what happens. Okay? So sin, sin, sin creates this, uh, sorry, the law creates sin inside of us because until I knew I shouldn't do that, I didn't know that thing was sin. Now I know I shouldn't do it. Now I know that thing is sin. So, so, so sin is, is magnified through the law, and the wages of sin is death. And, and so God goes, I've given you this law to, to protect you, to keep you as a nation, to hold you together until Jesus the substance comes. But they can't keep the law. They struggle. They, 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 they mess up over and over and over and over again. And if you and I were an Israelite living you know, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, we would have done the same thing. There's no, there's no difference. It says all are unrighteous. There's not even one righteous, not even one. That includes you and includes me. So eventually God makes, he, he has to make a plan and he saves us by his own righteous right hand through Jesus. So we have these handwriting of requirements that are against us. That's the law. It's against us. It's contrary to us. I battle to keep it. I can't keep it. As much as I try, I fail. Anyone tried and failed? But it says he's wiped it out. That's a good place to say amen. Verse 14. He's wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He goes on to say, he has taken it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. When you want to step back into religion, legalism, the law, and anything of that sort, we're trying to step back into something that he's nailed to the cross. We're trying to make the cross of no effect. We're trying to lower down the price that Jesus paid for you and for me. Jesus' price that he paid for you and for me was enough. And if, you, if anyone is sitting here today and say, but David, you don't know what I've done in my past. 
I want to say that none of us in this room should be so arrogant to think that our sin is bigger than the death of Jesus Christ. That our past is bigger than the death of Jesus Christ. That what we have done in the past is going to affect us for the rest of our lives. It doesn't have to because Jesus died for that on the cross. Amen? And he can turn all things, everyone say all things, together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen? I've said this many, many times in the past. Let me say this again because I've seen it happen. I see this happen often, over and over and over again. We should be able to walk into this room on a Sunday morning or a Friday morning like today, and if we see somebody else that, that maybe is a link to our past, it shouldn't even affect us in one little bit. Because we should, be able to, we should be able to interact and connect with and see and be in the same room as anybody from our past without it causing any shame, any guilt, any ill feelings, any unforgiveness, any sense of, oh, I just want to get you back. All of that's, oh, I just hope God gets you back. Now, I'm going to pray for you, but I'm also going to pray that God sorts you out. I, any of that stuff, we should be able to step into a room no matter what anybody has done to us. And if they were all in the room together and it was just you, you would be able to stand there in the love of God, in the forgiveness of God, without anything from your past and my past affecting our, our connection with people, our conversation. I'm not saying, like, if Osama bin Laden was around, it doesn't mean you want to sit and have coffee with him. That's not the point. I'm not talking about everyone's going to be your best friend. I am talking about the fact that we're able to not have any issues inside of us towards anybody. And nothing from the past affecting us in the way we deal with people. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That's what happens when he says, I've wiped away the handwriting of requirements. It was contrary to us. I've taken it away. I've nailed it to the cross. Anything less than that is, is lowering down the price Jesus paid. That was a good word. And then verse 15, I love this. It says, having disarmed principalities and powers. Who got disarmed? Principalities and powers. Did they get rearmed again at some point in, over human history? Anyone looked over history over the last few years, maybe even what's happening now, and going like, wow, the principalities and powers are powerful? Maybe. Maybe you read the newspaper too much. I mean, I know we don't read the newspaper anymore. You Google too much. You watch the news too much. You listen to social media too much. And suddenly these principalities and powers seem to be incredibly powerful. But you know, God didn't change his tune. He disarmed them. They're disarmed. What's happening? The true, what is actually, here's, here's the news, breaking news across Fox, across CNN, across News 24, across SABC3, if anyone watches that, across um, Al Jazeera, ENCA, there we go, that's a big one, ENCA, breaking news, the kingdom of God is advancing, violent men and women are taking hold of it, we are advancing, the church is growing. People are being saved left, right, and center. Are there some bad things on the go? Well, you know, when the enemy is losing territory, he's a bit upset, right? There is bad stuff. Newsflash, there's been bad stuff throughout the ages. I would not have, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm a little bit of a, let's use the word, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little bit of a wimp. You know, I would, living in World War II would have been a bit intense, right? Just imagine. Living in World War II. So imagine one day you're kind of sitting there and next thing your house is blown up, it's gone. You know? It's happening in the Ukraine right now. It's happening in, in places around the world. It's happening not just in the Ukraine. It's happening in many other places. But here's what's really happening. The real story is the kingdom of God is advancing. All of that stuff is the, it's, 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 it's the you know, it said, what, did, what did it say when Jesus said, it said, you, he would, you will bite him on its heel, but he will bruise your head, Right? All of that stuff that's happening is the writhing of a snake that's dying. Jesus disarmed principalities and powers. They are operating illegally, and you and I have the legal authority to advance the kingdom of God across the nations of the earth. What's the worst that can happen? You and I die for our faith. That's the worst that can happen. How bad is that? You, exactly. You die for your faith. Where are you going to be? With Jesus. Does it get any better than that? So the worst thing that can happen is someone can kill you. So, the, so, so if there's no fear of death, what is there? Even death isn't something to be afraid of. That's why somebody said, I can't remember who it was, but it was an old guy from many, many years ago. He said, the, seed of the, martyrs is the, is the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. 
And it's a beautiful thing. It's like every time there's this persecution that arises against the church, the church of God explodes. But what I also love is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I think it is, says, pray for all men that, they, that you might live in peace. God's will is not for persecution all the time. His will is for there to be peace. And through peace also for people to come to know him. That's God's will. It says pray for those who are in authority so that we might live peaceful lives. So that all may come to knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Isn't that incredible? Stephen preaches a message and he gets killed for it. And, a, and persecution breaks out. The end of that persecution is the saving of Paul. Saul, Paul. The guy who was the main instigator of all this persecution. And then it says, and there was peace. And what continued to happen with the church? The church backslid. The church went into apathy. The church slowed down. The church started watching Netflix. No. In that time of peace, the church continued to grow, continued to prosper. So it prospers in persecution. It prospers in peace. You don't have to have persecution to prosper. Amen? The church just keeps growing. That's, that's breaking news right there. So next time you turn on the news to watch the news, just turn to the person who's watching before you and say, I just want to tell you the real headline first. The real headline first is that Jesus is building his church. The kingdom of God is advancing and the enemy can do nothing about it. When you've had that conversation, then you pray together. Spend some time just praying. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And then watch what's going on. Ask God what you need to do about it and then do what you need to do. Amen? Okay, I have no idea where we are. I know we're in this building, but we're wrapping this up. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. So who got dragged into open shame? It was the devil and all his cohorts. He made a public spectacle of them. That moment where he's like, okay, we are taking the Son of God down. He is dying on the cross. That moment that looked like the, great, the moment of greatest failure was the moment of greatest triumph. So let's just remember that for your life and for my life today. Anyone facing a moment that looks like great failure, you are on the brink. You are on the edge. You're right there in the moment of greatest triumph. The worst thing that can happen to you and to me, the worst thing that could be happening right now in our lives puts us right on the edge of the greatest triumph. Because in the moment of what looked like the greatest failure for God and the greatest failure for his plans with humankind when they nailed Jesus to a cross, that moment was the moment, that moment, was the moment where Jesus nails it all to the cross. He disarms principalities and powers. He makes a public spectacle of them and he triumphs over them. If that was true for the big story, it's true for each and every one of our individual little stories. And everyone, when I say, I say little story, not, not in a disrespectful way, little story as in our stories are very small compared to the big story. Every story is significant. Every one of us in this room today are significant. He cares for us. And then there's a practical illustration that Paul then gives. He just goes on, verse 16, he says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are just a shadow of things to come. But the substance is of Christ. You know, so many Christians, maybe, let me not say so many Christians, let me not be awful eyes. Some Christians um, can't see the wood for the trees. You're looking at the little details and the little things and you struggle to see the whole picture. Let's, some, some of us need to actually just step back and go, uh, let's not be so concerned about it. When Paul says food and drink, festival, new moon, Sabbath, all of that was part of that handwriting that was, that was contrary to them. All that was part of a system that Jesus came to fulfill. Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. All, so, so Paul says, don't let anyone judge you. If you end up, I mean, you read some of the verses. I was chatting to my brother-in-law yesterday about this. He says, some of the things are just so weird in the Old Testament. Where he talks about certain, like talks about the mold in the roof of the something, and then you've got to do something with the mold. And then if that doesn't happen, you could break the whole house down. And, um, and all these kind of really intense, intense things, you know. And uh, the more legalistic we get, legalistic we get, the more we get stuck with the with the trees, the little the, these little details. And Paul just says, "Hey, listen, that's going on right now in the Colossian church. There are these there's people judging each other about you not celebrating the right festival, you know, because there's all these festivals that God put together in the Old Testament. Now you're not celebrating those festivals. Paul says, "Don't let anyone judge you for not doing that. Don't let anyone judge you for what you eat or what you don't eat." For each of us, there's a conscience we have between us and God, and we, we are servants of God. Let, let, let that be where the conversation takes place. But don't let the people around you judge you. Don't, don't let them pull you back into something that is just a shadow. Because we're, the substance, the substance is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He did a complete work on the cross. 
He stripped sin of its power. He stripped the demonic world of its authority and its power. Through his death, he satisfied the wrath and he satisfied the justice of God so that you and I today could be alive, become free, become whole people. Amen? We're going to take communion this morning as we finish off today.